welcome everybody. And it's been great chatting to so many different people and hearing their stories. Today, I've got John Armstrong, well-known travel, wedding and portrait photographer. And he's gonna be telling us about his story in the industry and how he got to where he is now. So John, tell me, you originally started off in the film industry. What made you make the move across the stills? Yeah, well, thanks for having me uh, on for a chat. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, I was initially, um, when I got out of school, I actually didn't really have a clear understanding of what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I kind of wasn't very academic, uh, probably more about me just not applying myself than anything else. School really wasn't my thing. I, I excelled in sports and I excelled in art. So I kind of thought, um, you know, maybe get into something in the arts when I leave school. So I kind of looked at it a couple of different options. And I think it was my mom who said, well, listen, I've got a, a you know, film school opening up in Cape Town. Uh, would you like to study film production? So I thought, well, that's a, that's a great idea. So, um, you know, I was willing to take anything at that stage. Uh, and I did have some sort of interest in the film industry. So I, I went into studying a, it was a two-year course. It was at City Varsity. It was actually the first year it opened in Cape Town. Um, I think it's still around City Varsity. It's near Long Curve Studios in Cape Town. And um, pretty old school way of teaching as well, because at that stage, uh, you know, in the television industry, people were using beta cam cameras, those big, big video cameras. And in film, most people are using 16 millimeter film or 35 millimeter film. So all my initial sort of education was really loading film um, in dark, in bags, uh, you know, learning really the real sort of technical um, aspects of lenses and, and shutters and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I had a really good solid foundation in what I learned. And then when I got out of it, I went straight into the film industry um, in Johannesburg and then I moved to Ireland. I was there for about eight years. And my girlfriend came with me. She was my girlfriend then. She's now my wife. So we've been together like 23 years or so. So, yeah, that was, you know, it was, I really enjoyed the film industry, but sure, it was a, a hectic industry to be involved in, especially when you start at the bottom, you start as a runner and then you make your way up. Yeah. But you never really have any sort of creative influence on the process. You tend to, um, you know, follow orders from the, the few senior people on set. And I got kind of, kind of tired of it pretty quickly. Uh, I took a lot of that uh, information that I'd learned from it and I just transferred it into photography. So behind the scenes, I was doing landscape work for myself. The next thing, you know, people were buying my landscapes and I was maybe making a bit more money that way. So it gave me the confidence then to get out of that and move into photography. Yeah, uh, that, I, I, so I can imagine that. And, and it's amazing that you, you mentioned that and I'm just hearing it over and over again. And it, it's something that I think really needs to be addressed. How many of us, I think every one of us who in the creative field that I've spoken to said we really battled at school um, and find our niche in, in life afterwards. So from, from you went in there and then you started with, with what you're doing, was there a major break that got you going or was it just hard work of slogging through it? Or, you know, how did you? Yeah, I mean, I mean as, I, as I transitioned out of the film industry, I, I did have to take on ordinary work. Um, in Ireland, I uh, did waitering. Um, in the beginning just to make it back because I needed to live and then I remember at that stage uh, film cost me about five Irish punt and then became euro later per roll of film and I remember how um, how protective I was over my film you know half the half the fridge which was a tiny little fridge in my apartment was film and the other half was food and I would go around and do a lot of street street shooting and uh, even landscapes and so on so I loved it but I was like, like I would literally have something an idea in my mind of what I wanted to shoot I'd load the film, be very careful how many exposures I would shoot off just to get the roll going because I didn't want to use too much film. And I would then go down to that place and shoot there. Never mind the fact that I've missed so many great opportunities on the way to where I was going. I just didn't have the money to just blast off film. So I, I was kind of doing that on the, on the sides. I was doing other jobs. I started working for a family member in Ireland. I actually did sales work. So I drove Ireland mm -hmm. for a job uh, to Dell and IBM and all these big companies. I was dropping off packaging for these businesses. But the great thing was, is on the way, there was areas for landscape photography in Ireland, especially the west of Ireland is exceptionally beautiful. So I would stop on the way, get some photographs, and I would build a sort of portfolio. And then people were buying the landscapes. And then we wanted to come home because we wanted to start a family. We got married because we wanted our children to be in South Africa, um, especially with the other family members here. So I just said to my wife, listen, um, you know, clearly, they, you know, I have something that they, there's a market for me in some way in photography. Uh, let's just give it a go when I get home. We have a clean slate. I'm, I've got X amount of months that I need to make it happen. I don't want to do another job. And we just use that opportunity because we had to make the move. 
that I just got home, hit the road running and uh, hit the ground running and I just got my photography business up and running pretty quickly. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, you're mentioning and, and I think back to my days when I shot film as well and we had, uh, it was all still life work that I mainly did in those days. I, I do more um, varied work now, but then it was very much food, jewelry, um, anything that shone people gave to me. And, you know, we literally had two Polaroids, two sheets of four by five or three sheets of four by five um, film or eight by 10, whatever we were shooting. And that was it, you know, and you just had to get it right. You couldn't go and just fire away like you can now with digital. So people are really lucky having that opportunity to, look, maybe it is a bit hit and miss sometimes, but but that training is absolutely essential and, and was a, a great, great training to, no, to get. Absolutely, no, 100%. I mean, we were, I, I consider myself fortunate to have lived through this change in photography. Yeah. A lot of what I learned before, I just carried it on and it set me, it gave me an advantage. There's no doubt about it. Um, now, youngsters are getting advantages in different ways because they're learning technologies quicker than maybe you and I are. But I think our base core understanding of what we do in some ways can be stronger because of just where we came from. I think. Absolutely. I think it does. But, I, you know, I think we all evolve and things evolve and I think one just got to go with the times and I think that's, that's mainly what it is. But I think just count ourselves lucky for that. And, you know, you yes, said you've lived in Ireland and, you know, you're there and you've come back, but you've also traveled a lot and your photography has allowed you to do that. Uh, what are some of the most exciting places you've been to or most interesting? And, you know, tell us a bit about your travels. Yeah, it's not something that I've marketed. It's not even something that I've kind of, I never initially thought that I would do. Um, you know, I got into weddings because weddings was a quick way, not quick way, it's the wrong way to say it. I don't mean it in a, in a bad way, but it was a way that I could guarantee an income where I knew what I was earning in advance because you know you can take booking six months to a year in advance for weddings so I could at least build a platform of income and then I could then do things on the side for myself but what actually happened was where I had kind of kind of plans of things that I wanted to do it was really the wedding industry that introduced me to certain people okay. so say for example I did a shoot of a bride and a groom and it was a family member who enjoyed their photos well that family member was involved in something totally different not even wedding related or wasn't planning to get married say listen i'd love to use you for this and then that moves to this and it's what i learned is really just about connecting between people it's you know photography is actually a small part of the whole story it's, it's more the relationships with people and that kind of allowed me to go on these ridiculous uh you know come over to the states or come over to the uk i mean even weddings i mean i've shot weddings in the uk i did a really cool one at a castle in the UK. It was snowing. We were, we were actually trapped in the castle for about a week. We couldn't get out because of the snowfall. So I, had to, I almost missed Christmas at home. My family almost killed me. But I've been, been pretty much uh, to all the major sort of, uh, sort of cities. Um, you know, I've been across the States. I love the United States. It's actually my favorite place to travel. I've been around Europe, parts of Africa. What I tend to do is I go in there for a particular job, but I always kind of get in a couple of days before. And then I hit the streets and I do my own street work. Yeah. And then I do the job and then I come home. So I use, the, I use every opportunity. I don't just arrive and take it for granted. I, I shoot as much as I can wherever I am. Yeah. Jeez, it's so interesting. And, 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 and um, it's just what you were saying there. It's, it's, it's the photography is a small part of it. And I think every element of photography, um, when I go back and I talk to my assistants, it is only just a small part. It's the connections. It's how you treat people, how you work with people that makes the difference and pull in, and, and get to know people. And, and it, it also seems in doing that, you've obviously met a, a couple of um, really well-known people. And I was just looking through your portfolio and, and I must say, it is absolutely incredible work. I love the work that you're doing. And there seems to be nice. a look that you've managed to create in, in, in all the different genres and we'll, we'll touch on some of them. Um, but yeah, it's obviously allowed you also to meet some quite well-known people and have the opportunity to photograph them. How do you find doing that with the celebrities you've yeah, met? Yeah, again, like I, I can't really put down as to why I'm there. I sometimes got to pinch myself because it's, I kind of feel that sometimes I haven't really done anything in particular. Like, like I understand the hustle of meeting people, but I haven't hustled to that degree. But mm -hmm. I've always been the talking, but I've also, like I've always treated whoever I've worked with with that much respect. So even if it's, even if I'm doing a tiny job and it's two photographs that I'm training for someone at pretty low cost, I don't treat them any differently to anyone else. So I kind of I feel like I take every particular job that I do seriously. I don't uh, overstay my welcome and I don't go, like for example, I, um, I get to photograph uh, Sir Richard Branson once a year at the, at the same time. He comes out to Ulusava in the Kruger Park. He brings in guests for different reasons. It's all to do with Virgin United and his charity. Um, 
and I don't take it for granted for a second that I'm there because you know it could, could quite easily be any other photographer. There's a ha there's, there's millions of photographers who could do a good job of those photographs. I, I'm not under any illusion. But when I arrive from the start, and I've done it like maybe eight nine years now in a row, I've always um, uh, you know treated everyone there with respect. I don't I'm not over friendly with uh, Sir Richard Branson. I don't chat to him all the time I, do, I do get in and do my job i photograph him if he wants to chat to me during the week we do and, and he's he's 100 percent comfortable as uh, as to what's going on and, and i have a, there's a mutual understanding of what i need to do while i'm there and while i'm there i've seen videography teams come in i've seen other people coming to do work at the same time and they tend not to last more than a season they don't get seen again yeah. and i've seen people like just get over friendly like you know next thing you know this well-known person is your mate and they've got the arm around them and it's i've just kept my distance i've just done what i needed to do yeah. as professionally as i can and he requests that i'm i'm the same person who does it every year so like when i say i know people i photograph them i know them to a degree but i keep my distance and i just put my head down and get my my job done right. yeah it's, it's so interesting hearing that and, and how to do things and it's Sometimes, and, I, and I, it's a horrible thing to say, sometimes we, you know, in the profession I'm in, uh, in the side I'm in and the advertising side, it's like, oh, you know, those guys are doing weddings or those guys are doing this and, you know, I'm doing advertising and you, you sometimes the ego gets better of you. And, and the one thing I've realized in, in all the talks and things that, that I've done with people and um, wedding photography, I think, is one of the most difficult things to do. Uh, I, don't, I, would, I don't think I'd make a good wedding photographer. Um, it's, it's not my style. It's not the way I work. Um, what do you think it takes? Because I, I have huge respect for wedding photographers personally um, in, in the work that they do and, and, and the, the circumstances that they're under. You know, they have to stay in the background, but they're so important. How do you manage those weddings that you're doing and, and you've got these people who spent a fortune, it's their special day that you don't take, take over it. What sort of advice could you give to those guys who may be wanting to start off in wedding photography? Yeah, it is. It's an incredibly demanding um, part of photography, wedding photography. I, I, I still maintain that if you are not sure which photographer to get for a particular job, mm. um, that you could find someone who specializes in that job, but if you were to grab a good wedding photographer, that would do a reasonable job in almost every aspect of photography. Not saying they would be the best in a particular type of photography, but they, they know how to handle pressure and they know how to think on their feet because you don't have time to think about things. You've got to get things done very quickly and a lot of pressure, people waiting on you. Um, so it takes someone who's got patience, it takes someone who's willing to take a bit of a pounding and keep their mouth closed yeah. and just keep working. You, you can't be someone who reacts uh, emotionally to charged situations. You've got to be willing sometimes to be a psychologist in the family. I've had to break up fights. I've had to, I've to, I've had to do the most, the most ridiculous things on wedding days. Yeah, I mean, I've had people full on going at each other and I've actually pulled them in the room and I say, listen, this is her most special day in her life. She's getting married today. Can we just put this fight on hold? And when I leave, you guys can go to each other tomorrow. But today, this is not the day for it. And then we have to break it up and then make sure everyone's okay. And we, we get on with it. Often it's between, it could be mom and mom-in-law. It could be mom and bride. It could be, um, it could be, you know, a situation between parents. There's a little bit, just because of the decision made on the wedding and next thing, you know, the arguing and it just brings negativity to the whole thing. So, You've got to deal with a lot of, uh, I'm not saying this is every wedding, I'm just saying those are the extreme situations, but a wedding photographer is someone who can think quickly on their feet, who, um, who, there's another aspect which I didn't discuss earlier, there's also another reason why I do well at these other jobs that I get, or at least not do well, but I, I get chosen to do these other type of jobs. As a wedding photographer, we edit photographs at a pretty high degree, at a really quick pace. So we can edit photographs to look really good very quickly because we've got, we've got uh, uh, tons of images to get through. We've got mass, we've got volume. Where another photographer will work on one photograph or a series of photographs, but he has a week in which to do that or she has the week to do that. So when I go out and I do a job for an event where families from overseas fly into the Kruger Park and I'm just with that one lodge, I do all their portraits and all their game work. When they leave, they have the images edited and handed over and they're gone and they're edited at a high level, the same level I would shoot a wedding at. So, so what happens is like, say six lodges have you know, booked these families and there's six photographers. If photogra photographer goes to each of these lodges, well, I've seen those photographers come and go. 
And I've seen the wedding photographers remain year on year out because every day they get the images back, they pick, they edit, they get it out quickly because they're used to that volume of editing. It's not a, it's heavy on them, but it doesn't impact them. Like I've seen these photographers come back from a week in the Kruger who are not seasoned wedding photographers and they are crying, they are broken, they have one hour sleep a night, they, they're destroyed, they're absolutely destroyed because of the amount of work and volume that's been put on top of them. So we have the advantage of being able to get through a ton of work pretty quickly at a high level. But most importantly, and I said it earlier, is that we've developed people skills. We've de developed how to deal with people and be subtle in certain situations. Yeah. I think that's where, that's most of where I struggle because if I look at the work that I do, um, I'm the director, I'm, it's my show. I've got my art director with me and the client and we are the main focus. And then we have our team around us that do it. We perfect it one shot maybe or two or three shots an entire day, get it to absolute perfection on a bottle or a ring or a piece of the food or whatever. And then we edit just that. So it's a completely, and I don't think people really understand that. And it also comes down to equipment and a whole lot of things like that, where I know we're using the, um, the same cameras and we're using the same brand, the, the Fuji brand, and we, we're working on that together. But I think people um, yeah, focus too much and say, oh, I've got this camera, I've got that. And they don't realize that there's more to it than just the equipment. And, and that's only a small part of the, the actual business is what camera you have and what lights you have and what is the actual building of the whole scene, whether it's in my business or your business. And that, that's so important to it. Um, but just talking on the equipment side and doing it just so for those who are wanting to get in, what, what sort of basic things do you take with you in your bag wherever you're going? Yeah, I mean, I recently, I said recently in the last sort of six, seven years, I made a change of gear. Uh, as you mentioned, I now use Fuji Film. Um, and initially I made that move because of the mirrorless system. So I'm now totally mirrorless. I've left all mirrored bodies and DSLRs and things like that. And I've learned over the years that um, for me, the image uh, sensor size, or sorry, not the image size, the sensor size is not as important as I used to think it was. Yeah. Um, I used to, I kind of got duped into a lot of marketing where you, you had to have this gear, you had to have this lens, you had to have this. And when I worked as a professional for so many years, I learned very quickly that, um, yeah, don't get caught up in that. Just, you can actually, I mean, put it this way. I don't think, we have no excuse. Any camera that's manufactured today that has interchangeable lenses, uh, even even one that doesn't, but let's just say the interchangeable lenses. If if you can't create an image with any one of those cameras, well, it's, the, the gear is not your issue. It's you need to hone your skills. You need to improve what you can do. Even kit lenses, even lenses that are slow and not fast, like Absolutely. you've got to be able to get given a camera and be able to create an image with. And there's no excuses. We have amazing gear. So my criteria wasn't like I didn't have this. Well, I've got to match this or I've got to have this quality. I knew the quality was there. I was more looking at how am I going to be able to travel around as much as I do with one bag because only one bag goes into the plane, one goes underneath. So my stands, if I because I use two off camera flash and stuff, goes in my main travel bag. The bag that goes into the uh, to the overhead uh, baggage is just within its limits. It's uh, you know it's one of these. It's fairly big, but it's within the airline's limits. And I just found that the gear that I use now is perfect for that. So I use the Fujifilm X-Series cameras. I also use the medium format 50R, but I use that for different kind of scenarios. I don't necessarily use that for the wedding work and a lot of the portrait work. So, and the other change that I made is that I left zoom lenses and I went to uh, primes. So the beginning of my even wedding career or portrait career, I shot with three primes, super wide, mid, and then long. Those were the three lenses. And now I shoot with just a wide zoom, sort of a very wide to sort of mid zoom and then I, the rest of them all primes for portraiture and i just learned that i just prefer moving my feet than to zooming i got a little bit lazy you know you kind of stand then you zoom into situations to look for photographs and i go i don't look for photographs when i zoom anymore i look for it with my feet and my eyes so it changed the way i shoot not saying that everyone has to do that but yeah for me it was simple just get the gear size down i know like if i hand over an image with an aps-c size sensor and i hand it over with a, a 35 millimeter sensor the client you, even you, Malcolm, an experienced photographer, if I hang two images, to you don't know which sensor was shot on which. You, you have no idea. So a lot of these arguments over here is, I think, just fruitless, to be honest. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I, look, I'm, a, I'm an advocate from the old school, um, and while well, I was talking about gear, of um, that I always believed you, you choose your equipment and whether whatever you 
area of photography, you choose the right piece of equipment for the right execution. So sometimes we would shoot eight by 10 inch, you know, the massive large format film. Sometimes I would shoot 35 mil in, in film days. And it's, I think the same now, you know, the times I've also got the X cameras, the X-T3, and I've got the GFX 100. I need the GFX 100 for my jewelry and still life as game billboards and things that make sense for me there. But there are other times where the X-T3 would make better sense and is a better camera than the other one for that application. So I think, yeah, I, I com completely agree with you in, in that I, it's, it's what you make of it and how you work with, with the equipment that you've got. John, yeah, we, we're in a really awkward stage at the moment and I was chatting to you the other day and we were talking about the different things we're doing. I'm, you know, I'm doing online courses and doing online businesses and trying to do things. How are you finding now? And, and also, by the way, I think your, your YouTube channel is amazing. And um, guys, if you get the chance, go and have a look at um, John's channel and see what he's doing there. I'll jot down the details of, of his channel in the, um, the, the comments below here but things are changing are you finding that you're needing to change the way you work with the current situation and, and more online work um or are you going to just feel that you're going to move on in the same direction i'm just I'm totally unsure as to what the way forward is uh you know sometimes i wake up every morning and i'm just like what what's going to happen what's the future going to hold mm -hmm. are the things that i'm pushing now are, are they even worth pushing like like what is gonna, what's going to be the best for me after this lockdown comes to an end but I've just decided to put my head down in certain directions. For me, the YouTube channel is one of them. Um, it doesn't earn an income at all, but I'm building, I'm using this opportunity now where I had no time before to really build a, a subscriber base. I'm now using this opportunity wisely to, um, you know, to build that sort of following, uh, the subscriber sort of aspect of the uh, YouTube channel so that if I do put out a product, if I do create something, I at least have an audience that trusts me to some degree going forward. And I've, I've built a relationship with these people. So I think, I think right now everyone's scrambling to get money now. And that's very difficult because, you know, I need money now like everyone else. We all need to pay, pay the bills. We all need to get food. But, you know, you, we can move to a desperate situation where we're doing things just for the sake of the income, less for the sake of what we want to do from a photography perspective. So for me, that's the one thing I'm doing. I'm just um, focusing on building another aspect to my business because I never want to be caught in the situation again where I have only one income stream coming from one type of thing. So I'm using this opportunity to diversify, as I said earlier. And one way, like one aspect of it is just keep marketing myself from a photography point of view because it will come online again. Mm -hmm. The other side is YouTube. Um, yeah, and I'm just looking at different products. Like I've rebranded myself now. I've, I've already gone and done new logos, new branding. Um, so I've been pro. I don't want to wake up and get stuck in a lull, like explaining things for things to happen for me. Uh, irrespective, I've just decided, irrespective of how useless what I'm doing is, in the end of things, at least I'm doing something. So if I put my net out far enough with different things, I'm hoping I catch some fish. Yeah, and I think and one's got to do that. And what it's, I, what I've found is I, I've never been a great one on social media. I think it. I don't know whether it's a generation thing or that I'm in that generation that doesn't quite get it maybe um but what this time has done is it allowed me to learn a lot more and i've become far more active on social media and it has allowed me to actually meet a lot more people and talk i'm talking to you i've talked to lots of different people and i think it is that spreading your web your, your web wider and trying to get trying to get more people involved in what you're doing and i think that's going to become very relevant going forward and um, welcome may i ask what, what what age are you now um 57 almost 58 yeah so like, like from your, like, I mean, I'm in my forties now yeah. and I've got like sense like to try and reinvent myself in, in my forties is, you know, it's, it's, it's a daunting task. Like, I mean, for you, like you, can you, can you see yourself doing something outside of photography? I mean, that's such a great question and I'm pleased you asked. Um, look, now I'm at where I am and the one thing I've learned and I keep on saying it, I was chatting to another photographer who's asking about photography is that my concern is when you're on a time-based business and I've got so many photographers. I mean, I could, I don't know, friends of mine that are in their 60s, 70s and that who are struggling or still working, can't retire because the problem with time is you've only got so much time in a day and you can only sell so much. And if you're booking out a day, you're never going to create wealth. And I've tried to build businesses. I've tried to do things. And 
I think internationally you get usage if you're an international photographer and that helps a lot. So I, I yeah, I think I've, I, I am reinventing is a horrible word, but I am having to try different things. So I will keep on doing my photography, but I'm doing things that are completely not related to photography to sustain my photography. If that makes yeah. sense. I have to. The older, I mean, there's no doubt about it. Like you, you're pretty invincible when you're young, you know, like, hmm. but, you kind of don't use, I can, I can definitely go back and use some of my time that I had more wisely. There's no doubt about it. Like, um, in, especially in this, you know, I've had a run of success in the sense that I've, I've always been busy. Like, does that necessarily equate to long-term security? No, it doesn't. So you've always got to be on your toes. But, but I've been fortunate that I've always, like, on, when was it? Three days ago, I finished my last edit for a client. Meaning, this is the first time that I can remember, like in at least in the bulk of my professional life, that I haven't had one edit to do after a shoot for a client. Mm -hmm. So right now I've just come, like I have no, three days ago I broke ties with the world totally. My like I was feeling comfortable because even though I'm not getting paid, I'm wrapping up a job from before. Mm -hmm. Now there's like it's quiet and it's a, it's a really weird feeling for me for working my battle for so long every day. Literally every day I have an edit of something. I'm kind. So most nights when the family go to sleep, I go out to my office. Um, I'm working 12, 1, 2 in the morning most nights just to get some editing done so I don't fall behind. Um, and that's now I end it. So like now all my energy is going into videos and other different things, but it's a really weird feeling to just be so connected to something for so long and then have it totally cut. Yeah, but you know, this, this, the scary thing is, and just listening to you say that, and that's where I've been as well. And, you know, we were in the same thing here. You know, the last payment came through for my last job last month, you know, because I get paid 30 days and it's now been six weeks that we're in. So we're now at the end of where the last job was done and we haven't been able to work since then. And, you know, we think to ourselves, well, you know, this has happened, but it can happen. Anything can happen. You could get, you know, run over, you could fall over and break your arm or your hands and you can't work or something for, for a long period of time. And the thing is, if you look at a lot of us who in time-based businesses, how long can we survive if something happens? And most of us, I would say you're looking at a three to four month span. So you've got to look at, you know, YouTube will, will you know, something like that, at least it can give you an ongoing income. And if you build it up or, you know, I'm doing workshops as well. So where we're we going to be selling workshops, uh, I mean, courses. Um, on, on just different things, you know, teaching and mm. sharing information, your intellectual property, um, things that are going to actually bring money in on a, on a long-term basis and, and allow you to save. And I, I think there's going to be, you know, I think this is a big wake-up call to people to actually, you need to rethink the business model. We need to rethink the way we do business. It's not, I don't believe it's sustainable in the long term for people to be yeah, able to no, survive. No, I agree. And you only know that. I mean, I tell my kids now, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I say, guys, I wish I'd listened to my father when he said, look, just save something. Just, you know, compound interest and do something down the line. Because you're gonna, if you're going to get into the career you're going in, you're going to hit a wall. And I've hit, you know, I've got to that age now where we're hitting that wall. So yeah. it's no, no, it is scary. And no, it is scary. We really need to take into account. But it's not all doom and gloom. But... I, I do believe, and I don't know if you agree, I think there are a hell of a lot more opportunities now than there were 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I've kind of been, it's fun. It's funny, like now that I've been able to connect with a lot of people um, because you're forced to um, in, a, in a greater way. Like even amongst the ex-photographers when we chat, um, I kind of, I can disconnect from the world for a long periods of time. I and mean, I actually lose track of the photography community just because I'm so stuck into the work that I'm doing. Uh, and I actually was quite naive to actually what it's like for many photographers. You know, I don't even think for a second what it's like to be one of the other guys who works in that type of photography. How often does work come in for him or her or whatever it might be. So I've been a little bit disconnected. Um, like I've been quite fortunate. I mean, I've worked my, like for me, it's, for me, it's, it's, it's also down to how, um, sort of how willing are you to work and work hard? So like when you say opportunities are rife at the moment or we're in, in relation to what it used to be, I, I'd agree, I'd agree. But what I find with a lot of people is they're not really willing to, to work. So 
Um, and I think now we need to look at all different opportunities and be very open to yeah. ways of thinking. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I, I don't, I'm not a great reader. It goes back to my, uh, my issues at school. I didn't really, like, I don't think I properly completed one book in my whole schooling career. Like I think I just skimmed over books, but fortunately with technology is that, um, I get to listen to books while I'm uh, editing. So I use audible all the time. So every time I'm editing, I'm listening to stuff. And I've lo- I am constantly learning stuff outside of photography and I find those things have helped me more than learning sometimes the stuff that's obvious to photography. Mm. I know it's bizarre, but like just really like whether it's politics, whether it's business, whether it's economics, whether it's, mm. I just learn as much as I can and all of it kind of builds who I am and my identity as a person. And it just it rounds people off. So you just got to keep learning. I mean, that's, that's a, the important part of life. And also what's really helped me a lot in, in my photography, and I'm, I'm sure you must have found it when you're dealing with people, because you're dealing with such a wide variety of people, having a good knowledge about different stuff. You know, so if I'm meeting a business person and you can sit down and discuss business, a business strategy, you know, or something like that, and mm-hmm. they suddenly can warm to you and you, you're able to, um, identify with them easier it makes your photography a lot easier. I've just found that in my studios that having that knowledge and discussing that and being able to relate to them on the same level as them and understanding has made a huge um, difference on a lot of my shoots. No doubt about it. I mean, uh, that's what I was saying earlier with that educational thing. The vast majority of the things I listen to and learn is not photography related yeah. because of exactly that reason. So, like, I've been fortunate to have photographed two former U.S. presidents um, in portraits. For them. So uh, both uh, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. Now, um, the, the media gives you an impression of who these people are. I, I'm sure you can tell which person gets slammed more in the media than the other. Mm-hmm. But you, you really know someone when you meet someone. And I can tell you that it's not necessarily, uh, you know, I'm not saying one is better than the other, but um, take George W. Bush for an example. Um, like when he arrived, his, his security kind of left us and didn't bother us and wasn't sort of over my shoulder every two seconds telling me, I only want to hear one photograph per photo section that you're doing. I don't want you to do it over the top. They're not, they just left me alone. Uh, George W. Bush came up to me. He was discussing. He liked the shoes that I had on. He said, where did I get them from? Uh, and I said, I'd swap my shoes. If you could give me a pair of cowboy boots, I'd give him a pair of the shoes that I got from South Africa. So we got into a chat. And then I knew something about um, uh, some political history that he was involved in that he had been talking about. Mm. And we got into a conversation because I'd learned it, because I'd actually read some books on it or listened to some books on it. We had a conversation for a short while. And, you know, like the photo, taking the photographs, I'd spent an hour before he walked into the room. I'd prepped myself. I'd set it up. I was confident what I was able to do. I was kind of nervous, you know, photographing a president of the United States. It's it's nerve-wracking. But you just got to get your technical side down, Pat, set it up, get a second camera ready right there in case the one that's in your hand fails. And it wasn't like I got through it, but it wasn't the special moment. The special moment is us just chatting. And he was very chill. Um, where, you know, with uh, Bill Clinton, it was a little bit more hectic. You know, I'd, I only photographed one aspect. I have a colleague of mine um, from, from Hack Media in Johannesburg. He actually had to go into the room and do the meet and greets where a guest would come in and get a photograph with uh, Bill Clinton. Um, and he literally had the, the security guy saying, like, you take one photograph per meet and greet. I don't care if there's a blink. If you take two photographs, I'm taking that camera and you're out of here. And that's the pressure he was under while he's doing these photographs. So, um, yeah, it, it's just, you know, a lot of it's to do with the person that you photograph. How, uh, George W. was so open with me. And he's like such a, like, a, you know, like a real Texan. You know what I mean, that real sort of warm sort of person. And he didn't care. Who, like, we didn't care who he we were, he didn't care I was a photographer and he didn't care that he was the pre- former president of the United States. And then a little conversation we had. And at the end, he called the security over and said, no, 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 I want a photograph with John. So the security guy takes my camera and then gets a photograph with the oh, two of us. Awesome. So, and that's just because I can communicate on different levels because I've pushed myself educationally just to learn a little bit more. Yeah. Well, John, I mean, yeah, it's just been wonderful chatting to you and it's nice to just have this open um, chat and that and I, I really enjoyed it and, and learning and I learned so much from everybody that I talked to and I think everybody that's been listening to these, um, these chats that I've been having, I think everyone, if you just take one thing from each one and I think everyone has got that, so you use a cliche golden nugget or 
that, that you can take away from it and, and learn something from it. And I think John has, uh, you've just given us so many things that we can, that we can learn from it. And, and I just really enjoyed this chat and thanks very much for being on it. And, um, yeah, all of you, I hope that you've also enjoyed it. And yeah, John, thanks very much for the time. Thanks, Malcolm. I appreciate you having me on. It's good to see you again. Yeah. And um, yeah, hopefully we, hopefully we see each other in person soon. I'm, I'm looking forward to that day, and I'm sure we will get there. Um, but if everybody do you just drink, Do you drink time, beer, Malcolm? Sorry? Do you drink beer? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to because of my med Well, I can't. Every time I have a beer, I get ill <laughs> because of the medication. Okay, I want. Can, but can I, drink alcohol, can I drink alcohol-free beer, so that I do like. So I do like beer, but I drink the alcohol-free one. So I'm looking forward okay, to having we'll, a beer we'll, with you one soon. We'll have cocktails together, alcohol free. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, John. Well, Thanks, man. Cheers. Yeah.